What I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about this notion of brainstorm, which is uh, the, the name of this book that my daughter named, actually, who is a 19-year-old. Uh, and I have a, also a 24-year-old. And in helping them get through the adolescent period uh, and still be in it, actually, um, what struck me was that what was available for us as parents or available for adolescents in the popular literature was stuff that wasn't actually quite accurate for what science was telling us this period was all about. Uh, and so as I went through being a parent of teenagers and then in their early uh, 20s for our son, uh, I really wanted to dive deeply into the scientific literature to see what's actually known. And then the contrast between the myths that are out there and the science was so striking that I thought it would be important to put that out there. Uh, and when I was talking to my kids about it, it really became clear that there was nothing available for an adolescent, him or herself, to actually read about that period of life that was deeply going into what's really going on. And then when I looked even further at the books that were out there, there was nothing for both an adolescent and an adult to read and actually share with each other. They may not read it together at bedtime or anything, but they could at least read it separately and then have a conversation about it. So I decided to start looking into the science, looking into the literature, and put that together in this book. And I wrote it up and sent it out to some teenagers, sent it out to some parents, got their feedback, rewrote it, edited it, sent it out again, got their feedback, rewrote it, until finally it's the final version that's out there. And it was literally the hardest book I ever wrote. Because to find one voice for both adolescents and adults to relate to was really a challenge. In writing it, this is what the myths that came out uh, that's around the popular literature. And, and I'd like to see if you've heard them. How many of you have heard in the popular media, newspapers, or even books, that the adolescent period is this really, really terrible time that you can't believe you're getting into and you hope you can just get through it OK. Have any of you heard that? And that message is so sad, and it's actually so wrong. Uh, and it, when it, as an adolescent, of course, if you hear that message, it makes you feel like, oh my god, what's going to happen? Or what, what's going to happen to my peers? Um, and so we're going to explore, in fact, how rather than being a period you have to just endure and barely get through, adolescence is an incredible opportunity for really wonderful growth. <coughs> And part of that growth is about learning about the self uh, that you can do with mindfulness practices and other things we'll talk about. Um, but part of it is just learning even about how your brain is changing, which we'll talk about soon. A second myth, and you can tell me if you've heard about this, is that adolescence is a time when your hormones are raging out of control. How many have heard that? <laughs> yeah, and that's actually not true. The hormones change because of puberty, so with sexual development, of course, there's a whole new set of hormones that are arising, and that is a change, for sure. But the changes in the way we think as adolescents, or we feel as adolescents, or even how we behave, is not due to what happens with our hormones. So here's, here's the idea, that it isn't the raging hormones that make for the changes that do happen in adolescence. It's actually changes in the brain that we're going to review in great detail in just a moment. The third myth that is really striking is, and maybe you've heard it, uh, that adolescence is a period of immaturity and that we don't get mature until like even the mid-20s. Have any of you heard that? Yeah. And actually what I'm going to suggest to you, thank you, what I'm going to suggest to you is that that's actually not only wrong, but it's a destructive way of thinking. Because then you enter the adolescent period, you say, well, I guess I must be just immature. So what would you do if the whole society was telling you you're immature? You'd be immature. Why wouldn't you? You'd have to be out of your mind not to do what people say to you, right? No, I'm just kidding about that. But you would act the way people expect you to be. And so the problem with calling it immature is, first of all, it's wrong. And secondly, it's destructive. And thirdly, the truth of it is, is that it's a necessary period of change. And when you understand the way the, thank you very much, no problem. When you understand the way the brain uh, is changing during this time, you realize it's not a period of immaturity. It's necessary for both the individual and for our whole human species in order to change. So 
Let's review what we do know about the way the brain changes. And these studies have only been done the last dozen years or so. And they keep on emerging. We're doing them at UCLA. They're done at the National Institute of Health. Uh, a lot of them are done in the United States. So we should just start this review by saying these are studies of American adolescents. And I say that because if we went to Papua New Guinea, where the ages of which people change are different, the age in which they take on adult responsibilities is very different. If we study their brains, you'd probably find something different. Um, someone from Europe asked me about some questions, and I've gotten this question a lot from European parents. Um, why do we send our adolescents away to college? Shouldn't they stay at home during college? Um, which is the way it's done mostly in Europe. Uh, now, it's hard to say this here at a boarding school where you've actually gone away for high school. Uh, but that's what a lot of European families experience, and they think the American way is different. And if we studied European adolescent brains, it might be different. I don't know. That's never been done. So we need to say these are studies of American adolescents that have been extensively done. We start studying the brains of healthy, regular kids before adolescence hits, follow them all the way into their early 20s and even late 20s. And we see that the brain does these changes that I'm going to describe for you right now. So before we talk about the changes, um, how many of you are familiar with uh, the general structure and function of the brain? Just so I can get a feeling for it. Oh, great. OK. So you're going to be very happy. Those of you who are familiar with it, and those of you who aren't will be very happy that the Middlesex School has been so kind, along with inward bound mindfulness education, they've supplied a model of the brain that they've taped under your chair. So if you, if you reach under your chair, yeah, this is, seriously, if you reach under your chair and, and see if you can feel under that chair and, and pull out your arm, and you'll see attached to your arm is a ham. And the school and IBME have invited you to take this hand home with you. It's your handout. <laughs> OK, so if, if you take your hand like this and fold your thumb in the middle and fold your fingers over the top, and my daughter says, don't ever say this, so don't tell her I said this, but it's a handy model of the brain. It, it, it's actually oriented in your head like this, OK? And this is a very useful model of the brain. You can tell her I told you that. Um, and we're going to review the basic parts, because these basic parts are parts that are changing in adolescence, number one. And number two, when you know about it, we now know for sure that you can use your mind to strengthen the structure of your brain. And when I first started writing about that, people said, oh, you're out of your mind to say that. And that was over a dozen years ago. Now we know it's absolutely true. Mindfulness is one example uh, of using the mind to actually strengthen the way this brain functions. It's now been proven to be true. And so what I'm going to review for you is how this brain works, how we can use the mind to change it, and what happens in adolescence for the change in the brain. So let's take our hand model, put it together, orient yourself. And now this is your neuroanatomy lesson. If you feel squeamish, feel free to lie down. Um, <laughs> let's lift up the top of the brain, the outer part. That's called your cortex. Let's lift up the thumb part. And let's look at the whole structure opened up like this. The first thing is your brain is up in your head. And it's sitting on top of the spinal cord, which is in your backbone, which brings all the signals, for the most part, up from the body. Uh, it goes in other ways, too. And the first of three major areas we're talking about is in your palm, in the model. Does anyone know the name of this part of the brain? It's called the brain stem. The brain stem is the oldest part of the brain. Oldest both meaning when you're in your mother's womb, it developed fully in the womb. So it's old that way. But old meaning it's about 300 million years of evolution that created this. So it's called the old reptilian brain. And we're just going to name these parts and talk about what they do in just a moment. The brain stem then is beneath the next part of the brain, which would be your thumb. And for most of us, we only have one thumb, but a perfect model would have two thumbs, because uh, you'd have a left and a right. And this is called the limbic area. And this area evolved about 200 million years ago. It's halfway developed when you're born. And then when you put your fingers over the top, this is your outer bark of the brain called the cortex. And this is an area that's most advanced in mammals, so it's called the neomammalian cortex. It has different lobes. The front lobe would be from your second knuckles forward, 
and that's biggest in primates. And in we humans, the part that's most elaborated is the prefrontal cortex, which changes the most during adolescence, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let me talk about what these areas do, and I'm gonna relate those to what changes in during adolescence. And for those people who are adolescents now, I want you to think about how your life was, let's say, when you were 10, how it changed when you went through puberty, and how it became when you're 14, 15, 16 years of age, and, and if you're older, then older than that. And so think about these functions and how they work. And if you're an adult who used to be an adolescent, then I want you to try to remember, if your memory still works, um, back to those days when you were an adolescent. OK? You ready? So lift up your fingers and lift up your thumb. What's this part called again? Brainstem. Excellent. So this is the part that does two really big things. It keeps you awake in class, and, or it tells you to go to sleep. So if a teacher's really good, he or she will make sure your brainstem is telling you stay awake. And it also is involved in something that's um, not so comfortable to feel, but we feel it a lot anyway. In a threatened situation, we feel what's called a reactive state when we feel threatened. And that reaction can take the form of four different pathways. You can fight, you can flee, you can tighten up your muscles and freeze, or you can totally collapse and faint. So fight, flee, freeze, and faint are the four things people do when they're threatened. And this can be threatened, for example, when you're about to take an exam, when you feel kind of overwhelmed or helpless, or it can be where someone literally is, is threatening you, or you're having a fight with a friend or a fight with somebody else. So the brainstem mediates that, okay? And if I shouted out no, no, no to you really harshly, you could feel that. In fact, let's just do that just for a brief experiential thing. So I'm gonna just say no a few times and just let your body respond and see what that feels like. You ready? No. 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 And now I'm going to say yes. 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 Now take a deep breath. And let's just see, with a raising of hands, how many felt the difference between the feeling inside of you with no and with yes? Raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's just a test to see if you're awake. And uh, <laughs> shout out some words. What did no feel like? Harsh. Harsh. Tight. 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 Tense. Retreating. Retreating. Yeah. Shocking. OK. Fear. OK. And what did yes feel like? Gentle. Gentle. Calm. Soothing. Soothing. A smile, okay? So in the brain, we have two basic states that are created, and it's really important to experience this directly. One is a reactive state, it's like a no state, N-O, no state, and the other is a yes state, where you're receptive. And as we go through life, it's really important to monitor which state we're in. And as we interact with our friends, it's important to know what state they're in. And if you're a parent and an adolescent, you need to figure out what state each of you are in. Because if one of you is in a reactive state, it's not going to be too rewarding a communication happening. And to learn a technique to bring yourself from the no reactive state to a yes receptive state is essential. And actually, that's what mindfulness practice allows you to do. If any of you are still feeling up tense from the no, just, just do one more exercise. Put one hand on your chest and one hand on your abdomen and put a little pressure there. And you can close your eyes if you want, and just feel how that feels. And now reverse it so the hand on top is on the bottom, the hand on the bottom is on the top. See how that feels? And now move it to whichever way is most comfortable for you. OK, and let's just do a quick show of hands. How many of you felt one of those ways actually felt pretty good, pretty calming? Raise your hand. OK, take a look. Raise your hand really high so everyone can see. Excellent. And let's just do a quick survey. How many felt right on top felt really better than left on top? And how many were the other way? Left? Isn't that interesting? OK. Now, for any of you adolescents who are thinking of going to college, and any of you who think of going to college and want to do a study, 
No one has figured out why it's always the case. It's about a quarter of the population are left on top people and three quarters are right on top people. And it doesn't have to do with left right handedness. So if you can figure that out, you can get a PhD. Um, <laughs> You'll be all set to go. No one has figured it out, but it, it's always true. And, and some people are both up and down, and some people, neither one helps them. Uh, but the vast majority, over 90% of people, and I've asked thousands of people now that. I just wanted to see if it confirmed. Every time it's the same way. So you, anyway, but this is a good technique to do, too. So this is a very calming technique. I've done physiological measures on myself and other people who do this in the way that works. And you can show their whole physiology calms down. They've taken themselves from a reactive state to receptive state just with that movement. So just learning that is really, really helpful. It's a quick tool to know that you not only can monitor what's going on inside of you, but you can modulate it. You're not helpless to just say, oh my god, I'm reactive, I'm reactive. You can learn a technique like that or like focusing on your breath that brings you to a receptive state. Okay, so that has to do literally with the brain stem working with other areas of the, of the brain to tell you whether you're being threatened or not. And it's a deep process in the brain. So if you're in a reactive state, you need to realize that. And even if you say to the person you're interacting with, hey, I need to take a break, that's better than trying to push forward in a communication when you're reactive. Because reactive communication gets us nowhere. Very, very important to know about. OK. Now, the limbic area is partially developed. This is your thumb area, so put that on over. Your limbic area is partially developed when you're born. And this is going to be shaped a lot by experience especially experiences with your attachment figures. And I was just at a, 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 um, a Harvard um, conference where we were talking all about this issue of how our relationships with our parents shape the way the limbic area develops. And what does the limbic area do? It's very important for working with the areas below it on creating emotion, creating motivation. So what do we feel and what are we driven to do? And it's also important for what's called appraisal, meaning it evaluates whether something is important or not, and whether that important thing is good or bad. So a teacher in a classroom, for example, needs to get connected with the student's limbic areas so the student feels this is important. I think I will pay attention to what my teacher is saying. Right? That would be a useful thing. Or what my friends are saying. These are all ways the limbic area is evaluating the significance of something. There are two other things, memory and, and attachment relationships. Attachment basically is the kind of relationship we have with close others. So when you're one year of age, who are you attached to? Who? Your mother or your father or other caregivers. In fact, we evolved to have many caregivers, not just one. So we can have many attachment figures, not a dozens of them, but we can have more than one. And those caregivers, those attachment figures are very important. So when we're upset, we want to be seen so we can be soothed and feel safe so we feel secure. Those are the four S's of attachment. You're seen, meaning your inner mental life of feelings and thoughts are seen by your caregiver. So that makes you feel not alone in the world. You're kept safe. So you're protected from harm. You feel soothed. So when you're distressed, Communicating with your caregiver helps you calm down. And then you overall feel secure when you're in a relationship with that person. So it's pretty cool. And we as mammals invented this thing called attachment. And when you're a little kid, you're attached to your parents. And then interestingly, when you enter adolescence, this is the first big change we're going to talk about, the limbic area basically starts to change once you go through puberty. And instead of having dependence just on your parents, who else do you find you want to get connected to when you're upset? Your friends, your peers. And this is a big difference. Now you can say, well, that's, that's really sad if you're a parent. I want my little baby at home, right? And I know I had to go through that when my kids started pushing away. And I'd say, what's wrong with her, that 13-year-old? She wants to be with her friends, not her dad. And I would, I would say to her, let's go to the movies, like when she was nine. And she said, she'd look at me and roll her eyes. She goes, I don't think so, you know? <laughs> But that's good. Her limbic area was developing. Now, why would you have a period of time when the limbic area, which was so attached to your mom or dad, would say, hey, I'm going to get with my peers now more? Why would this be not a sign of immaturity, but a sign of a change that is necessary? It's nature's way to get you ready to move out. Yes. Did, would you want to add something to you? 
And survival, right. It, you know, we, you actually need, and there's a long biological reason for this, but you need offspring to leave the nest. Now, if you think about it, when you're like two years of age, three years of age, you know, eight years of age, think about this. You wake up, someone makes you breakfast, right? You go to school, you play, you do whatever, you come home, they make you dinner. They tuck you in at night. Why would anyone in their right mind leave that situation? <laughs> like now that I'm saying it, I want to go back, mom, where are you? If you think about it, who in their right mind would leave that? Well, you've got to change your mind by changing your brain. This is the thing. So the first change we're talking about is the limbic area is getting ready to become more active and push away from parents being the attachment figures only. Doesn't mean you have to isolate yourself, but you get ready to push away from only being with your parents. Okay, so that's the first thing that happens. The limbic area is also then communicating if you put your cortex down with the cortex and the cortex is what we use to map out all sorts of things. Like when I move my hands like this, the way you see them is the back of your cortex is making maps of what's going on. The front of the cortex, uh, well, the side is for mapping out sound. The upper side is for mapping out your body and where it stops and starts. And the front part is for thinking. And the frontmost part is for doing all sorts of things which I call mind sight maps. Mind sight is the ability to see the mind of yourself or others. So part of this area makes a mind sight map of you, that is of myself. Let's say I'll do it from my point of view. So I have a mind sight map of me. And the mind sight map of me says what's going on in my body right now, what's going on in my emotions, what's happening in my memory, what's happening right now in this present moment, what happened before, and what would I like to happen in the future. So it does what's called mental time travel. It's awesome, and we know exactly what areas of the brain do that. So if I'm going to really have self-awareness, I have to have a combination of mindfulness of the present moment, but also I have to be open to what's happened in the past and know where I've been, and I have to be open to creating a future I want to make. This is a big change in how an eight-year-old thinks when you start developing these mind sight maps. And one of the biggest changes in the way we think it when we become teenagers is that we start thinking about ourselves in a totally different context. Now, those of you who are adolescents now, let me ask you, when you think about how you think about yourself now, do you notice it's different than how you thought about yourself when you were eight? What do you think? And any one of you. No pressure. It's an invitation. What's that? You think of yourself critically. You mean like, like critically, meaning thinking of yourself with harsh words? With harsh words, okay. So that would be a good example of how like, a part of you is being like pressuring yourself. But you, maybe you weren't doing it when you were eight. So that would be a good reason to actually do mindfulness practice, because in mindfulness practice, it teaches you to take that harsh critic that's judging you. And one way of defining mindfulness actually is being aware of the present moment and letting go of judgments and becoming more compassionate toward yourself. So that would be a great example, because that is what a lot of teenagers feel, especially when you feel all the pressure, like go to school and get good grades and all that stuff, and so do it this way, right? So mindfulness practice would be great to deal with that. How about any of the other adolescents? Any other ways you notice you're thinking differently now than when you're eight? OK, any adults who once were at, oh, did you have something? OK, when you're eight, you thought about friends, and now you're thinking about work. And what kind of work are you thinking about? Say it again. So anything, you have, like all the things that are on your to-do list? Yeah, so OK. So now you're, you're, this prefrontal cortex is now not just thinking about friends. It's actually planning out what's coming next. What do I have to do? What do I have to do? And actually, mindfulness is helpful for that, too, because you can actually have your plan and instead of having anxiety and pressure about it, it just lets you see the plan without having it loaded up with anxiety. So that would be a good example of how the adolescent brain changes, because you start to think about the future and what you have to do in very different ways, because this prefrontal cortex is developing now. So as these changes are happening, and they're going to keep on changing to the mid-20s, um, so we say the adolescent period actually goes from around 12 to around 24, more or less, like the second dozen years of life. It doesn't end when the teenage years end. 
And what we know then is that this is not a period of immaturity, but let's review what it's actually a period all about. The brain is changing in a way that gets the adolescent to push back on the adults that raised her or him. And adults experiencing this think, oh my God, this is rebellion, this is immaturity. But actually, it's necessary for both the individual to get ready to leave the nest, which is absolutely crucial, and it's also necessary for our species to go out in the world and not just keep on doing things the way the adult generation has done things. So this pushback, pushback is absolutely a healthy part of adolescent development, whereas adults sometimes look and go, oh, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Now, what do you need to actually do that is you need a change in the way the brain is weighing the pros and cons of things. Because if it just stays like an eight-year-old brain, it says, look, I'm familiar with my home. I like getting tucked in at night. I like someone making me dinner. I like someone making me breakfast. I don't actually want to think about all the things I need to do. And I just want to kind of be here with my mom and dad. I mean, if, if that's what I have and it's good, that's fine. So you need the brain to change. And how is it going to change? It's got to change in two fundamental ways. It's got to have a change in what feels rewarding. And it's got to change in the way it weighs pros and cons. And that's exactly what happens in the brain. There's a system in the brain called the dopamine system, which is also called the reward circuitry. And once you go from being 8, let's say, to 14, the dopamine system changes in a very profound way where dopamine gives you a feeling of satisfaction. Like, I've done this work, and now I feel like I've completed it. Or I've done this sport, and I've worked out, and I feel like I've completed it. And then you get a dopamine squirt, and that's great. But the dopamine levels in adolescence, the baseline levels drop which means that you are no longer content just doing what you're doing because there's a feeling like I gotta be doing something. And that's why some adolescents feel boredom if they're not engaged in doing something much more than they did when they were eight. So that's one change. The second change in dopamine is that the release levels are much higher. Now what that means is that when you do something you're, you're passionate about doing, the dopamine release is much higher and you feel a deeper sense of reward. Now this change in the reward system is crucial because one of the most important kinds of experiences that release dopamine are doing new things, novelty. Doing new things actually secretes dopamine. Now the upside of that, and there's always upsides and downsides to each of these changes, the upside is that you be driven to do new things, which is kind of cool. But the downside is what? What's the downside by doing something new? It's dangerous. When you go out away from the nest, it is dangerous, right? So the brain's got to do one more thing to deal with that danger. It has to do something else. And what it does is it changes the way the limbic area and the cortex work together to evaluate the pros and cons. And the formal research term, and you can tell me whether this is a term you feel comfortable with, but it's a term in the science. It's called hyper-rational thinking. And the hyper-rational thinking means that, let's say, um, you're going to go, you get into a car and you're 16, and you say, I'd like to drive this car 100 miles an hour. And it's 2 in the morning, so the chances of someone being on this street at 2 in the morning are so low that I'm going to do it. Because how exciting would that be to go 100 miles an hour in my mom's car? <laughs> right? So the rational part of it, it's true. At 2 in the morning, there's probably no one out on the street. It's, the probability, rationally, is that it's like that. But let's say there's a 10% chance that someone is on the street. And you're going 100 miles an hour. What might happen? You might kill them. Like what happened to my favorite teacher in my psychiatry training, he was killed by a 19-year-old going 95 miles an hour on a local street, right? And I always wondered, like, what was that 19-year-old thinking? Until I found this set of research studies that show that adolescents absolutely, on a whole, know the dangers. Informing them about the dangers doesn't change anything. They know about the dangers. 
It's their limbic area and their cortical region basically have this hyper-rational thinking where they're just weighing the pros much higher. 100 miles an hour, how exciting could that be? Uh, there's a 10% chance that someone could be on the road and I would hurry them. But, but my God, that, that's so exciting, and a 90% chance that nothing will happen. And so they engage in the behavior. So what is the myth is that dangerous behaviors in adolescence are due to impulsivity. This is not impulsive behavior. It's actually not, because in impulsive behavior, you say, okay, just think about it, or here, know about the risk. So this is where you say, well, what can we do? And here's something that is completely not intuitive to understand, because the brain, just to review it, this adolescent brain is going to be more emotional. The limbic area is going to bring more emotions up into the cortex. And it's going to be more socially engaged, so the adolescent will be more influenced by what happens with peers, for sure. Novelty is going to be there, and so there's a drive to do new things. And these things explain risky behavior. But then what can we do as adolescents to try to prevent that? And what can we do from, from harm happening? Or what can we do as adults? Because sadly, and I don't want to scare anybody, but for those of you who are adolescents and those of you who are adults taking care of adolescents, let's just say what the research shows. The healthiest time of life when your body can fight diseases better than any other time is during adolescence, between 12 and 24. Healthiest time of life. The most dangerous time of life of preventable accidents that lead to serious harm and death is adolescence. From accidents to suicide to murder, as we know, sadly, in this country with all the shootings that are going on, these are adolescents that are involved in these things, often adolescent males, but adolescence. So what's going on here? Right? These are huge important questions that literally are a matter of life and death. So the concern for those of your adolescents that your parents have when they say, you know, wear a helmet when you ride a bike, or if you go to a party and you get drunk, call me, don't, I don't want you driving or driving when someone's drunk. They're not just out of their minds, they're actually accurate about the danger. So what do we do to help with the danger and decrease it? Here's what's counterintuitive. When you get an adolescent in touch with what their body is telling them is good, not their emotions that just say, oh, it's going to be exciting, 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 but I mean literally, we now know around your intestines, literally around your gut, you have neural networks that are like a gut brain. And around your heart, you literally have neural networks that are a heart brain. And mindfulness as a practice gives you access literally to what your body signals are telling you up in your brain, in your head. And what we know is, is that the values that people have, like, for example, if you said to that person who sadly killed my professor, if someone had taught him to be mindfully aware so that when he got into that sports car his parents bought him, and instead of going, oh yeah, the chances are so minimal, although he did this at 5 p.m., on a Friday afternoon when you couldn't imagine more traffic there, but in any event, you know, whatever his equation was, if he could have said, you know, in my gut, in my heart, the idea of running someone over and killing them feels so not right intuitively, even though my emotions are telling me this would be so exciting, so exciting, and my appraisal centers, not that anyone thinks like that, but my appraisal centers are saying, oh, this is so exciting, I should do that, his gut and his heart would tell him not to. Because adults telling someone not to do something doesn't get them not to do it. You know, it's like, do you know, uh, what, you know about smoking and how it causes harm to your body, right? Does everyone know about that? So, um, the, the adolescence is not only a time of danger for risky behaviors that lead to harm to self and others, but it's actually a time of most risk for getting addicted to cigarettes or to alcohol or to other drugs. Um, because of this dopamine change, that's, dopamine is the reason we get addicted to drugs. Because any drug of addiction, you actually secrete dopamine and then you get in the cycle of needing it, needing it, needing it. So, Adolescence is a very vulnerable period. By the way, it's also the primary time of life when if there's going to be a psychiatric disorder like depression or manic depressive illness or schizophrenia or any of these other serious 
illnesses, and I was just at a conference on a different kind of disorder, personality disorder, they emerge during adolescence. So this is a very vulnerable time too, because there are a lot of changes in the brain that we'll talk about in just a moment. But here's the issue, is that when you get a person in touch with their positive values, let's say in smoking, how can you get them to stop? Well, the first thing they thought about is let's just inform adolescents about how dangerous it is to smoke. Now, based on what I just said, now do we know that most adolescents are aware of dangers? Yeah, they are. They have that knowledge, right? So informing them actually isn't going to do it. So then they decided they would scare them, right? The adults put together these ads that showed these x-rays of horribly diseased lungs and said, look what's going to happen to you. Now, these were adults then showing adolescents pictures of diseased lungs. And how do you think that affected the kids smoking? Not at all. So what would you do, based on everything you've heard about adolescents pushing adults away and wanting to be in touch with their own values of what's important, what do you think they did that actually worked? This is like this brilliant move. You could do peers doing it. I guess that would be great. That would have been good. They didn't do that, but that would be great. Have peers say, hey, that's not cool to do that. They didn't do that. Here's what they decided to do. They said, hey, um, did you know that the adults who own the cigarette companies realize that you are going to get addicted to this stuff and they're going to take your money from you and get really rich because you're vulnerable to them just you, making you addicted to this stuff? And the kids stopped smoking. Why would they let an adult treat them like that? Right? So it was a perfect ad to say, look, this is what's happening. The adults really want you to do this. They said, I'm not doing it. You know? <laughs> it was so smart. I mean, that's clever. That's clever. So let's just review in brief the essence of adolescence, and let's first highlight exactly what's happening in the brain. If you had to come away from this talk and say, what's actually happening in the brain? The word is remodeling. Between 12 and 24, the brain is remodeling itself. It goes from Basically, you're born into the world and the brain is ready to learn from your parents and then from other adults. And so before around, let's say, 11 years of age, the brain is like a sponge. It just soaks in the knowledge of our culture. We learn, we learn, we learn, we soak it in. Cool, that's great. And then something huge happens around 11, 12 years of age. Huge. There are changes in the way genes are being expressed, changes in the way the brain is going to grow. And two big things are, are what's happening in remodeling. One, it sounds a little scary, but you just need to know about it, is called pruning. Genetically, the brain, the brain is designed to start cutting away the existing neurons that were there, and the ones that will remain are the ones that are going to be used. So if you're an adolescent and you like music, keep on playing music. If you like sports, keep on doing sports. Whatever you like doing, keep on doing, because the brain is going to start specializing, and if you're not using it, you're going to lose it. And this becomes a really important issue for any adolescent to know about, that find what you're passionate about and really keep that going in your life. It's also why schools should teach foreign languages before adolescence hits. So kids really start soaking that in and keep that going. OK, so that's one thing, is that you're going to have pruning. The next thing you're going to have is called myelination, which is where you're laying down this really healthy sheath among connected neurons. It allows things to work 3,000 times in a more coordinated and speedy way. And so overall, when you allow the pruning to happen, you're specializing the areas. And then when you connect them with myelin, you're actually linking them. And the term we use for linking differentiated areas is called integration. So the beautiful thing about everything happening in your brains as adolescents is that your brain is becoming more and more integrated. The more integrated it is, the stronger it is the more efficient it is, the more coordinated it is, the more resilient you are. So in the Brainstorm book, what I do is I put exercises that have been proven to increase integration in your brain. And it teaches you as an adolescent who's doing the book or as an adult who wants to catch up uh, for what they maybe didn't get, um, it, teaches them, it teaches the reader how to integrate your brain. Because the fabulous news is you can actually keep your brain developing at any age. It's great during adolescence to take advantage of the changes that are going on remodeling, but even as adults, we can use our minds to change our brain. 
So let me review with you then what we've covered in terms of the essence of adolescence that makes it, for me anyway, memorable. And as Jessica said, I love acronyms. And so this is the one acronym you're going to get tonight, which is the word essence. E-S-S-E-N-C-E. -S -S -E -E. Fortunately, we've covered everything, so this is a review. The first thing, E-S, take your, your brain model out. And this, by the way, you do get to take this home, so that's fine. Um, what we said is that research shows that the limbic area and brain stem and body are going to be producing more signals that influence the reasoning of the cortex. Those signals are the source of emotion. So ES is emotional spark. The first of our essence is emotional spark. We are more filled with passion during the adolescent years. Um, and the sad thing is, as adults, sometimes we lose that passion. And so this is the first element of the essence, emotional spark, that we need to think about as adults. Maybe we need to try to reignite in our lives. So the emotional spark is absolutely how the brain changes. And the drive of that, of course, is it gets you to get ready to leave the nest. Very, very important. The downside is what? Emotions can be really confusing sometimes and look like they're too stormy and a different kind of brainstorm. And you're all over the place. So for sure, there's a downside to it. But to use mindfulness practices, and the larger term I use is time in, where you go inward and develop your ability to see the mind, which I call mind sight. These mind sight skills, one of which is mindfulness, uh, allow you actually to balance your emotions more. And it's why learning mindfulness during the adolescent years is so important. So that's the first thing, emotional spark. S-E. Anyone, can anyone guess what that is? Social environment. As we said, the adolescent period is a time to connect with your peers. It's absolutely necessary for your own development. Why would that be the case? Well, that's right. You cannot survive alone. We don't have big fangs. We don't have big claws. We are incredibly social species. So as you get ready to leave the nest, here's the issue. Having membership with your peer group for most adolescents, is literally a matter of life and death. It's not that you just want to keep up with peer pressure or keep up with the, your, the fad of the day of what your peers are doing. It's literally a millions of years of evolution that have been getting you ready for this moment to leave the nest. And you do that by being in numbers. We don't survive. I was just in Africa and teaching there, and I took some time off and went on the savanna, and, and I'm telling you, the way we as mammals survive is by being together with other members of our species. And if you're alone, basically, your brainstem is gonna tell you, no, 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 no. You're gonna be in a state of reactivity. And that's why, for parents, just know this, when your teen says, I really need to do this, I need to do this with my friends, their friends literally are a matter of life and death for them. That's just a feeling. It's not just they're being superficial. It's a deep brainstem limbic feeling that is created. And so this social engagement is really important. Now, the downside, of course, is that you may cave into peer pressure. But the upside is that what do we know is the best predictor of health in your relationships, I'm sorry, health in your life throughout the lifespan? Every study show supportive relationships are the number one predictor of your medical health, your mental health, and even how long you live. And sadly, some adults forget about that and don't cultivate and maintain their friendships. So social engagement, really important. OK, what do you think the N is of essence? What do we say allows the adolescent to leave the nest and push out to try new things, novelty? So novelty, seeking novelty, is literally hardwired into this changing brain. Now, of course, adults look at that and say, oh, immature or rebellious, just the opposite. Just the opposite. Trying to push away from adults and do new things, bless you, is actually the core of well-being. Right, so we as adults have to, have to address that. Now, the, the downside we've said are the risk-taking behaviors. That's not so good, and in fact, it's a real danger. It's super real danger. 
So we need to really balance this out by getting kids in touch with their intuition, getting adolescents in touch with their intuition. And we as adults need to be in touch with our intuition too, but we need to embrace novelty even in adulthood. One of the best predictors of your brain growing throughout adulthood is how you try new things, not just keep on doing the familiar. And yet a lot of us as adults, what we do, and don't, you know, don't worry about this adolescence, you don't have to do it that way, but as adults, what happens to us? You tell me. You get into the familiar, same old, same old, same old, and pretty soon your brain carves out the same circuitry, does the same thing over and over again, and instead of things looking fresh and new and exciting, instead of you feeling really deeply grateful for how amazing it is that we're even alive, right? Or, and if you practice mindfulness, you can have the experience where literally the ordinary becomes extraordinary. You know, I have a dear friend who died recently uh, we were exactly the same age, and you know, it was just out of nowhere. And it just reminds you of how precious this life is. And the moments that sometimes can be so difficult, like if your adolescent is doing something new and you don't know what's going on, take a deep breath and really reflect inwardly, and get a, you can get a perspective on how novelty is actually a great thing, not only in adolescence, but throughout our lifespan. Then there's the last part of essence. We have emotional spark, we have social engagement, novelty seeking, and the CE is creative explorations. You know, when middle schools and high schools ask me to come consult to them using this kind of brainstorm set of ideas, and they say, how should we organize our curriculum? And we have one whole province in Canada that's thinking about reorganizing it. What I say is this, I say, if you look at the emotional spark adolescents have, the passion that they have, that a lot of adults have lost, if you look at the social engagement, they have to collaborate with each other rather than compete with each other. The novelty that they seek out and the creative explorations that in various ways they're going to try to put new combinations together where you probably realize this, that in science, in art, in music, and in, of course, technology with our digital world, those advances primarily made by adolescents primarily by adolescents. In small ways and big ways, adolescents approach the world and say, you know something? The old world was like this. I don't need to do it that way. And that's why our species as a whole have adapted to every aspect of this planet. We've gone out and done things. So what I say when these schools ask me to consult is I say, look, here's what I need to ask you. And I don't know if this is true at Middlesex School, but I, in general in schools, when they ask me, I say, tell me what it's like in middle school. They go, our kids are so disengaged, they don't care, they're bored, we don't know how to really get them interested in what's going on. I said, how about high school? They said, just the same. They're just pressured, so much homework, they can't deal with the pressure and they worry and they think that which college you go to really makes a big difference and they're so pressured. And I go, well, yeah, this is an uncertain world, you want to grab onto something that's certain, like a score or something like that. I said, but what would happen if you actually took this essence of adolescence and organized an entire curriculum around it? What would that look like? And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, if you take the passion that's built into the adolescent brain to have these subcortical areas pushing emotion forward, the emotional spark, and you take the social engagement and get adolescents to actually work with each other rather than against each other, if you get them to collaborate, rather than just compete and demolish each other, and, you know? And, and the novelty, what if instead of saying, here's what the curriculum is, this is what we as adults have decided you must learn, and here's the test, and there's a right and wrong, what if you take a new approach to that and let them use their drive for creative exploration and say, look, here's what we're doing. You're in sixth grade, you're in seventh grade, you're an adolescent now, we know how your brain is changing, we're gonna honor that, so here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna assemble yourselves in groups, and you're going to pick one of these seven huge world problems, right? Climate change issues, famine, you know, with people not having enough to eat, uh, you know, pollution, war, uh, violence, all the things you can, you can imagine. You set them up. You say, so we as adults have created a world that you're about to inherit that's not so good. We've kind of screwed up. And we can't figure out how to get out of this mess. So here's your job. You're going to use whichever of these eight areas you're passionate about, assembling groups. You're going to engage with each other, the social engagement. 
You're going to look for new ways to approach these because we've got to fail. And you're going to find new creative solutions. And you know something? Not only would they learn to use the teacher as a consultant to help them find information and get experts in and all that kind of stuff, but I would bet you the kind of solutions that adolescents would come up with might just turn the tide and make this a better place to live. That's how deeply we need to respect the courage and creativity and collaboration of adolescents. So rather than all those myths, you know, that they're immature and they're crazy and they're, they, they, can't, they can't focus or all these things that you just have to barely get through it, we gotta, we gotta change the cultural conversation and actually tap into this unbelievably creative group of individuals, support them in being exactly who they are and reaching their full potential. And the, it's a win-win-win situation because when adults realize that they too can reignite their emotional spark, get more socially engaged, have more novelty in their life and actually put creativity in their life, they're gonna make their brains healthier, their own brains. They're gonna have better communication with their adolescents. Adolescents are gonna benefit because they're gonna actually be able to tap into their fullest potential. With the techniques of mindfulness practice and other ways of knowing about your body, these mindset skills, for example, that you learn in the book, this is an opportunity for us to change how we approach this whole period of time. And when we promote more integration in our lives as adults going through this process and also as adolescents, the result of integration is resilience and kindness and compassion. So all the ways we often live with harshness and a feeling of pressure, the studies are very clear. When you do these practices, when you actually take this approach, you can approach things rather than withdraw from them. You can calm your anxiety. You can release your harsh critic inside of yourself. You can collaborate more. You feel more connected. You keep your brain young. I can list all the ways your immune system is better. Your caps on your chromosomes will be improved. There's all these things. A study just came out that if you do these things, this was in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, a study came out, if you take a life of compassion and connection and equanimity, which all these things we've been talking about can create, there's actually a gene, a set of genes on your chromosomes that will be turned on that will prevent diseases. And I'm not exaggerating that. That was just published in one of the most prestigious scientific journals. What you do with your mind changes every aspect of your life, including the way genes will help prevent disease. It will actually increase the enzyme called telomerase. And Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for discovering this whole system. When you do these mindfulness practices, you will increase the enzyme telomerase that maintains and repairs these things called telomeres, which are the caps on chromosomes that allow your cells when they divide to maintain their integrity. When you do these practices, you'll increase your immune system's function so that you'll be able to fight infections better. When you do these functions, you're going to actually take the integrative fibers of the brain, the ones that we want to grow during adolescence and we want to maintain in adulthood, and you will grow them more. I'm not making any of this stuff. It's all in published. The most prestigious scientific journals around are publishing these carefully done studies. So that's the invitation. Bust these myths that have totally been distorting what the adolescent period is, of life is like. So for the individual and for individual families, it's gonna to lead to more collaboration and deeper understanding and more compassion across the generations. But for our larger world, think about it. Imagine the creative, collaborative intelligence that can be released if we make this happen. Now, no single book can do this, but an entire cultural shift can happen it's called cultural evolution. And I don't want to put the pressure on the adolescents in the room or the adults in the room, but I want to just invite you to think about this. Change only happens when individuals working together in collaborative groups bring the intention to bring a positive change into the world. And this is really something you can do. This is something we all can do. And I invite you to participate in how we can really bring a more creative, and compassionate approach to adolescence, to our adulthood, to our life together on this home we call Earth. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you.